If I can get your attention before we start the meeting, there's going to be a sign-up sheet down here. Uh, if you wish to speak on HB 87, if you don't mind, just put your name down. Testing. Testing. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started here. I'm sorry, we're running a couple minutes behind. Is uh, this time of the year, that's going to be a, probably somewhat of the norm as these uh, rooms get booked and meetings run long. I'm going to ask uh, Representative Cantrell, if you will, open us in a word of prayer. What number are you? Let's pray together. Lord, we're grateful for an opportunity to be together this afternoon and for uh, the time to consider how we can help small businesses in Georgia. We just pray for your wisdom and help us to see things the way you do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Representative. And thank you, each one, for uh, taking time out of your busy day to attend the, uh, uh, the House Committee on Small Business Development and Job Creation. And uh, Mr. Brantley, we're excited to have you here today. If you will, go on up. Do you want to come to the table or to the podium? What makes you the most uncomfortable? Up. Well, then stand up. Uh, <laughs> uh, kind of like Burr Rabbit, just don't throw me in there, right? <laughs> That's right, exactly right. But uh, Mr. Brantley, we appreciate you coming, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. If you will, just for everybody, I'm, I'm familiar with who you represent, but um, uh, give a formal introduction so everyone okay. gets acquainted with who you are, and we look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Burt Brantley, the Chief Operating Officer at the Georgia Department of Economic Development. Uh, and my hometown is right next door to Representative Shaw's uh, hometown. So, uh, I d oh, I'm sorry. And my actual hometown is Representative Carter's hometown. I did not see her come in the back. Um, so uh, really glad to be here. You know, I think when most people think about economic development, at least at the state level, they picture the Kia projects, the Pratt & Whitney project that we announced yesterday in Columbus, the, the large scale, the Baxter uh, project, uh, which is now called Shire out in Covington. That's what most people think about with economic development, but really at the core of our department uh, and our functions are around small business. And uh, with Mr. Chairman's uh, indulgence, I'm going to take just a few minutes to walk through a number of our programs uh, and we'll be glad to answer questions or receive more input and feedback from the committee on how we can better help uh, Georgia's small businesses. So I am contractually obligated to first remind everybody that we have been named the number one state in, uh, in, in the country to do business. Not sure if you've heard, uh, four years in a row, thank you uh, for that question. Um, we are, uh, we're obviously very proud of it. That is due uh, to the governor's leadership and to uh, General Assembly's leadership in making our state uh, a friendly place to do business. Uh, it, of course, we take that as a, a pride, uh, point of pride for our department, but really it comes down to you guys setting tax policy uh, and, uh, and other types of policy that help us uh, attract business and help us grow business. And so thank you for your work in that, uh, really proud of that. We are the ninth state for, in terms of the number of entrepreneurial loans that the Small Business uh, Administration uh, gives out. Uh, and we are also have been graded an A in terms of small business friendliness. Uh, and we've had a number of programs that we've had over the years to sort of increase that, uh, that rating that we get. So the, our fourth annual Georgia Small Business Week is coming up March 13th through the 17th. Uh, and we will be contacting you guys, particularly this committee, about supporting some of our activities and events uh, for that week. In particular, we have a small business rock stars luncheon uh, that is on March 13th. Uh, and so, uh, again, we'll be back to you about, uh, about details around that luncheon, but that is when we uh, honor uh, and recognize some of our innovative small businesses that are out in the state doing, uh, doing great stuff. So we have a small business team uh, at the department who served more than 1,900 small businesses in fiscal year 16. And more than 1,000 of those were direct one-on-one -on -one conversations with small businesses where they have called us or we have reached out to them and they've talked about what resources our department has and connecting them either with our university system uh, or other community resources or resources uh, at the federal level or things that we have at the state level. So really trying to be that connection point for small businesses to be able to grow and to learn uh, and to reach new customers and, and new markets. 
75% of those calls were from startup uh, businesses. As you guys know, most of our small businesses uh, are either a startup or they once were a startup. Uh, and so early in the infancy of a business is when we get the most calls uh, from small businesses around the, the state. The top questions they ask are about procurement, so helping with state procurement uh, opportunities, uh, and we're certainly glad to help uh, with that. And then also marketing-related questions. How do they market their business? How do they get in uh, to some of the marketing that we do? Uh, and so those are the top two topics that, uh, that they ask about. Some other questions uh, around our film industry, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. How do they get plugged into that industry? How do they find new markets, new customers, either domestically or internationally? Uh, home health care is a big topic right now with small business. Uh, and so those are some of the questions that we get from small businesses around the state. Uh, we've got a comprehensive website, georgia.org slash small business, that tailors the questions that we're getting. We tailor that information out to the small business community so they can even get those questions answered before they even call. We've got staff people that are focused on South Georgia and rural Georgia, helping small businesses there. The challenges they face in those areas uh, are different than the challenges that are faced here many times in many times in terms of zoning and regulations that they might face uh, in metro atlanta versus outside uh, the state uh, outside the metro area we also have staff members that focus on women and minority uh, businesses as well so helping them overcome those particular challenges that they face in, in starting uh, a new business one thing that a lot of folks don't realize is that small businesses qualify for some of our statutory tax incentives so again we think about in terms of kia you know, the job tax credits and those things that some of these large businesses uh, are eligible for, but things like our, our research and development tax credit, our opportunity zone uh, job tax credit, uh, our lending program, just a, our angel investor tax credit. There's a, few, a, n a number of, of programs that small businesses are able to, uh, to qualify for that you guys have passed and uh, have changed and put in Georgia statute. So that's something we help connect uh, them with as well. And then, as you know, the Georgia Department uh, of Economic Development recently uh, took in the Office of Workforce Development. Uh, and so now the workforce development folks are in with us, uh, co-located with us, and there are a lot of resources for small business through what we call WorkSource Georgia, which is our workforce development uh, program, on-the-job training, those kind of programs where they can find employees who may have been uh, either laid off or uh, have been separated from their position. We re help them get retrained uh, and then starting in, into a new career. Uh, and small businesses are our are, are most frequent uh, customer, so to speak, of those uh, of those newly new trained employees. We have our existing industry team. So these are regional folks who are out in the state, located in your communities. Uh, and more than half of the businesses that they work with are small businesses. They have less than 50 employees. So these are the folks, the backbone of your local economies. They are reaching out to to our regional folks. And we're reaching out to them, and again, helping make those uh, those connections. We also have a, a marketing uh, program where it's a digital marketing campaign uh, that is focused on small business. And you'll see that roll out, particularly if you're on websites that deal with Georgia a lot, which I know you are, uh, you'll start to see those because we'll target those to people who are here uh, and who are doing business in Georgia. I also want to talk a little bit about international trade. So again, you may think about more of the larger companies like Coke and Home Depot and UPS when I talk about international trade, but 57% uh, but of our international trade clients are businesses with fewer than 20 employees that really are the businesses that we can have the biggest impact on those are the folks that don't know how to do business home depot and coke they know how to do business overseas but uh, the small uh, business that's just getting started up is finding uh, new new customers uh, and new employees those are the ones that we can uh, that we really can make a difference with uh, so i mean repeat that stat 57 percent are small businesses with fewer than 20 employees 84 percent are small businesses with fewer than 100 employees. So the vast majority of our trade work is, uh, is with small businesses. Uh, we have approximately 14,500 exporters in Georgia. These are people who export a product outside uh, the United States. And 12,869 of those are small businesses. Uh, and so again, just to, some stats to reinforce that, uh, that uh, point that uh, the vast majority of the businesses that we are working with, helping them find new markets, helping them. We, we have international offices in 12 countries, uh, places like Japan and Korea uh, and in Israel, but also Colombia in South America. Uh, we have people literally located in those countries that usually are contracted out with the state uh, that can help our businesses find customers, uh, not just next door, but, but literally across the world. I also want to mention a little bit about our film industry. You guys have obviously seen a lot about our film industry in Georgia. Uh, when I was at the department 10 years ago, the economic impact in film was about 240 million a year. This year, uh, we're up to $7 billion a year in economic impact 
uh, of the film industry, you probably think, and I thought a lot about the Captain America, Marvel, Avengers, James Bond, that's most of the movies that we think about. But when those movies are shot here, uh, there are Georgia small businesses who are either selling construction materials, uh, carpeting, food, uh, all of the vendors that are located on these shoots, most of them are Georgia small businesses that are benefiting from all that activity here. Uh, for an example, uh, $848 million were spent with 6,246 vendors in Georgia in 2014 by uh, Motion Picture Association uh, members in Georgia. So that those dollars are obviously, they're well-paid actors that star in these movies, uh, but this money is also going out to, uh, to our vendors, to our Georgia-based local business uh, and vendors. Um, and I asked our group for some examples of that, and they sent, sent those to me, so I want to briefly go over those. Uh, Rick Myers, uh, up in the Dalton area, owns Myers Carpet, and he does more than a million dollars of revenue each year providing carpeting to the film industry, and we have helped him make a number of those connections. Kofor Brothers Hardware and Tucker, they've been in business almost 100 years. I got a shout out there for Tucker. Uh, they were in danger of closing during the recession, but they got connected with the film industry. They now have employees that work only with film uh, companies. About 35 to 40% of their product goes out or used exclu exclusively by the film industry. So this, the film industry really literally changed uh, the trajectory of, of, of that company. And then uh, Harris Diversified, which is in Dallas, Georgia, he's an electrician. His business was just he and his son-in-law back in 2007. He started working on the movie called The Blind Side. You guys may remember that movie that was shot here. Uh, he bought a bunch of air conditioning units, uh, was hired to cool the sets. Uh, it's very important for the sets to, uh, particularly in Georgia, to be, uh, to be cool when they're shooting those movies. He now has more than a million dollars of revenue each year. Uh, with the film industry, has 150 of those air conditioning units now, 102 generators, and employs 15 people. So just a couple of uh, examples there about how the film industry really does uh, impact all the way down to small business. I was just talking last week to uh, a guy who owns a furniture rental company, uh, and he has, he says, at least one truck a day in his loading dock that's either taking away furniture or bringing back furniture being used on movie sets. Uh, around the around the metro Atlanta area and 10 years ago that was not a part of his business at all so it really does uh, it really does have a, a big impact the last two things I just want to quickly mention and, and then again glad to take questions and and uh, and take additional feedback that you may have our, our tourism industry uh, I think you guys well know that the backbone of that industry is our bed and breakfast our restaurants uh, our, our tourism product that's out uh, in the state we offer free listings on our website and our Georgia Travel Guide for Georgia uh, small businesses. We offer consulting uh, to those businesses on how to connect with, for example, convention groups uh, or other uh, other groups that are that are maybe coming into your into your communities. Uh, we have regional tourism project managers, again, located out in the state in your communities, who can meet with these folks and help them get connected and figure out how they can plug into that to that business. Uh, tourism, as you well know, is a huge driver, economic driver in the state not just in Savannah, not just in Atlanta, but literally uh, all over the state. Every, almost every, well, every portion of the state has something to go and visit. Uh, and it might be a state park. Uh, it might be, uh, you know, quail hunting down in southwest Georgia. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why people go and visit all over the state. And we have uh, connections that we can help small businesses make to make sure they're plugging into that business. And then the last thing I want to mention, you, you, I think you guys know also, the Georgia Council for Arts is now uh, a part of our department. And... Uh, that may seem odd at first, uh, you know, uh, the arts are, are more of a, uh, of a creative uh, industry, uh, but of course film is as well, but it really has been a great fit uh, into our department because at the end of the day, uh, when we talk to economic development prospects, that what they're looking for is a workforce, looking for great education, looking for transportation, but they also want quality of life for their employees, and so the arts are such a critical uh, part of that. Uh, the Georgia Council for Arts awarded $1.2 million in grant awards to 187 organizations in 90 different counties. Uh, and a lot of those awards go to uh, either your hometown, if you have an arts council, uh, or maybe to uh, a gallery that's open up in your town. Uh, it could be a wide variety of recipients for those grant awards, but, but that economic activity that's going back into your communities, again, is, is, uh, is impacting those small businesses as well. So um, I really appreciate, Mr. Chairman, the opportunity to come and, and talk today. Uh, and just uh, and hopefully uh, you got a little bit out of it to just remember that when we talk about economic development, yeah, we're chasing 
the big, huge projects. We do that uh, a lot and regularly. Uh, but at the same time, those projects have benefits all throughout the economy, all the way down to small business. In addition to the programs uh, that I talked about earlier, where we have people who are focused on helping to, uh, to build businesses up. If we can build those small businesses up, that's going to help all of us. It's going to help the state as a whole. Uh, and if you have small businesses in your communities that we can help, please help them get in touch with us so we can work with them and, uh, and then connect them to the resources, new customers, new markets, uh, and help them grow. Uh, and uh, the last thing I'll just quickly mention that is not on my notes, so I need to be careful with this, but the governor also has, I think you guys have probably heard about the Guard Initiative, where it's all about uh, making sure we're maximizing the benefit of our military bases and, and our installations around the, around the state. We will be launching later this year uh, a, uh, a connection uh, website uh, and data, essentially a, a data pool on all of the contractors who have around the state who have contracts with our military installations and all that record, all that data is publicly available, but it hasn't been easily accessible. And so it'll have information about when those contracts expire and how uh, our small businesses can uh, can compete for that work. Uh, and so it's going to be a great uh, addition to to the uh, to the information we have already focused specifically on, on our military bases and, uh, and veteran-based um, services that are around the state as well. So, again, not in my notes. I have to be careful when I, go, when I leave my notes. But, uh, but uh, really excited about that as well, and we look forward to coming back and talking to you maybe next year about that initiative. It is uh, so critically important. So, we were disappointed to learn, but it's good to know that so much of the money uh, that a lot of our contractors here in Georgia have that money leaves the state when they subcontract out with, with vendors. And so we need to figure out how we can help our businesses here be subcontractors for our, for our large contractors that are already here. So we'll be working on, on that. I hopefully I have a good story to tell you next year. Well, Bert, we appreciate it. Mr. Brantley, that was a lot of information. And uh, obviously you guys do a, do a tremendous job over there uh, facilitating help and, and resources to uh, – this state and, and its business climate. A couple of things I wrote down, and I, I know we've got a couple of folks on the committee that have input or a question for you. Um, but one thing I, I wanted to mention, and, and you touched on it, was the uh, film production in Georgia. And I know you were talking a lot about, uh, and and down here we got a shout out on the uh, the hardware store in Tucker, uh, being able to keep its doors open. But but during film production is, is obviously the, the climax of, of revenue that's getting generated. But post-film production is quite impressive in Georgia, and I think that goes, uh, goes a, lot, a long way with the efforts of this General Assembly and the leadership of the governor with, and the work that y'all have done um, in, in creating a climate that, that's, that's friendly to do business in and people want to stay, and I think that's taken us a long way. Yeah, and, uh, and as you, Mr. Chairman, you well know, we, there's a, a bill this year that we are working actively on to, to make sure we craft that in a way that really does benefit uh, Georgia companies that are doing that post-production yeah. work as well. So we really look forward to continuing to work with General Assembly on that. Very pleased with the reaction uh, and support that we've gotten uh, on that industry in particular. So thank you for that. And, and I want to make sure, uh, Mr. Brantley, that everybody on the committee and in the audience heard the uh, statistics you gave. I know you repeated them twice. 57% uh, have fewer than... 20 employees, right. and 84% with less than 100. And uh, and guys, one thing you'll hear me say, and we're going to say it a lot, all business starts with small business. So uh, th this is who we're here to try to take care of and learn about. But um, all right, you've got Mr. Chair, couple. if I can share one quick yeah. story about that. Um, I just met with a, a company uh, two weeks ago. Uh, they are down in southeast Georgia, uh, and they uh, ship whole 40-foot-long uh, uh, pine trees uh, to China, containers full of 40-foot tall pine trees of China, China for them to process and do whatever they're going to do with uh, over there. And so it's uh, when those containers leave the port, uh, it, it is very likely there's a Georgia product in there, and it may be whole pine trees, which I had no idea that, that we did until I heard about that a couple weeks ago. But um, a lot of those containers that are leaving Savannah uh, have Georgia products in them. And uh, to the chairman's point, it is, uh, it's, uh, it is a critical part of what we do. Yeah, there's there's actually quite, and it's funny you bring it up. I I, I know a little something about the uh, pine trees going in containers, leaving our ports, and and uh, that's that's catching on all across the southeast and uh, southwest. People are, are processing logs, leaving in bark form, and, and loading in containers and and uh, shipping out. So uh, let's let's get to the committee because we got other work to do here, Mr. Brantley. Uh, number thirteen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I just watched a TV show the other day, and um, it 
24 Legacy. Okay, yeah. And I gathered that the um, subway scene was Mata. That's right, that's right. Yeah, that was pretty neat. MacGyver's being filmed here, met those that's folks. Right. But what's even cooler about them is they're working with our local growers in terms right. of the food that they're feeding their folks and all. And so they're really reaching out into the community and were a big supporter um, for the global growers in DeKalb County recently at a major function that they had. Of course, I had the um, Kofa brothers down here many, <laughs> many years ago. And just to reiterate on your, everyone has something. I mean, the Booth Museum up in Cartersville is something we should right. really brag about. Could you tell about the two awards that they just got? Um, one wasn't at the Southeastern I'll agree with whatever you say because I okay. do not. I'm not familiar. But okay, they it's, got, it is great. I've been there and it's yeah, awesome. It, it's an it's phenomenal. You'd never think a major Western museum would be in Cartersville, um, but it is, and it's a fabulous museum. The downtown is great, but they got a major major award for what they've done from the whole Southeastern Tourism Association. They also got some awards from Georgia, so it's something you can really be you know proud of for having and. It's not in the metro area. Again, it's a smaller outlying, yeah. and it, I mean, I love the industry. What can I tell you? I think it's fabulous. So I'm going to have Representative Henson do my talk next time. <laughs> I hear you. No, but see, that's <laughs> what brought me to Georgia was tourism yeah. and the hospitality industry. So, you know, I go way, way back with that. And we I just we, love we it. appreciate your passion, <laughs> Representative Henson. Uh, thank you for your comments. Uh, number two. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you um, for your presentation. I have a, a question. Um, I served on the House Study Committee um, with post-secondary option for individuals with developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that came up out of the study committee was making Georgia employment first um, state. And so I want to know, had you um, heard anything else um, pertaining to that? And um, I'd definitely like to talk to you a little bit more about it you know, offline. Uh, but I think that we're missing out on a huge opportunity with our uh, individuals with developmental disabilities being able to begin into the workforce and as a state promoting um, that um, those uh, individuals that we really, they really want to work and they're almost really up the best kind of workers. Sure, yeah, yeah. Thank you for those comments. I'd love to connect you with our workforce uh, development division. So there's the ones who are uh, particularly working with that, uh, with that program. But um, it is, uh, it's a great opportunity. I completely agree with you. So we look forward to working, working with you on that. I'm not uh, all the way up to speed on, on that yet, but, um, but uh, workforce development, we, we'll follow up with you and, and, and make sure we're um, addressing that need for sure. Thank you. All right, number 27. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is, is there, you know, every day somebody asks, is it where are there, if, are there businesses out there that uh, are for sale? or businesses that people are looking for investors to go into. Do, is there a resource somewhere for that? I know you can go in the paper and get stuff, but that's, <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about is there a real yeah. place to go uh, where people legitimately would like to either buy an existing small business or invest in an existing small business so I, I know for sure there are places that you can go and search out investors, absolutely. Uh, if you're a small business and you're trying to get started, uh, and, and so there are those services that will connect you with investors. I'm talking uh, about the, the reverse. I but I don't know about the reverse. Where I, investors are looking to invest, yeah. and they're trying to find businesses yeah. to invest no, in. That's a great, I'll, uh, I will follow up with that. I don't know off the top of my head, but we'll, we'll follow up with you on that and, and okay. get you an answer. And maybe it's something we, we need to look into. Or, or to buy. Or to buy, right. Yes. yes. Thank you. All right, we got we have one more, uh, number 14. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. My question, you mentioned that uh, there are restaurants that can post their businesses on the tourism site at no cost. Yes. Are those only restaurants or small businesses or what business in particular? So the, the, the travel guide uh, that we print out every mm -hmm. year, uh, the same information that's in there is also on our Explore Georgia tourism site. Uh, and so it does not, I mean, I, I don't know exactly if you have a particular uh, kind of business in mind, but it's any anything that we would think tourists would be interested in, in visiting. So it may be, uh, again, it could be a, uh, a bicycle shop if yeah. they need to uh, go and, and get their bicycle worked on to 
to take advantage of the trails. Uh, it, it's, it's a pretty wide ranging um, guide and, and website. So we can absolutely help uh, get those, those folks it listed. It is free to get listed. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you guys may have no, known this before. I apologize if I'm repeating something. So that guide is done at no cost to the state either. So we partner with the folks who publish Atlanta Magazine, uh, and there are paid advertisements in there, but we don't charge for listings. Uh, and so that is done at no, no charge to the state, and we, uh, we distribute about 700,000 of those uh, in a year, in addition to all the information that's on the website as well. So Thank you. You'd be glad to help them get – the more listings, the better, right? That helps us because it's more robust. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, Mr. Brantley. Hey, we really appreciate the uh, the work you guys are doing over at Department of Economic Development, and uh, I appreciate your time and willingness to stand in the most uncomfortable position <laughs> you said that you wanted to. So uh, I didn't want to get comfortable, so I thought standing I was better. Understand? Yeah. I, 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 well, you're in trouble. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yield about 28 minutes to Chairman Shaw <laughs> right here for cross examination. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Brantley, I just want to personally say how proud we are of you being from South Georgia and in such an esteemed position up here. I just wanted to ask you one quick question. Do you like this job as much as you did when you and I worked at the Department of Labor together back in Athens during college? So this is an interesting story. I, I probably should be careful how what kind of story I tell about Representative Shaw and I job sharing at the Department of Labor office in Athens. But uh, it, was, uh, it was where uh, I'd, I'd known Jason's father before them but we first met there uh, working the front desk at the Department of Labor in Athens so and you notice I didn't use any olive oil uh, examples during my, my talk as well but uh, also a great success story Georgia success story and, and I should mention real quickly too I'm sorry Mr. Chairman I know you're busy so uh, we you'll notice the advertising and marketing that's coming out of the department uh, going forward are going to focus on our Georgia businesses so we're going to let Georgia businesses tell their story and by telling their story, they're going to tell the Georgia story as well. So we have kind of got a shift uh, in our marketing that you're going to notice over the next year or so to where uh, we're going to let, again, people tell the story of why they're in Georgia and how they've been successful. Uh, and then through that, uh, that then tells the story of, of what makes Georgia a successful place to do business. So that's our new uh, sort of marketing theme that you'll see. Uh, over the next year and we'll definitely come back and, and show some of that marketing material to you but uh, to to chairman's point uh, about uh, the great success of the uh, olive oil business uh, that is a great success story and one that we should tell because it was done right here in georgia and, and uh, takes advantage of a, a great natural resource so all right well thank all you right. all right thanks thank you very much yeah, yeah. no no nope. nope. uh, other than the, the the chairman may want to consult with Chairman Shaw about a definition of work. I noticed he referenced he worked at the Department of Labor during college, and I have reason to believe otherwise. But uh, <laughs> all right, move, moving on, we do have other business to take up, and I know the committee members have other places to be. So uh, we're going to uh, ask Representative Rathlisberger to come forward with HB 87. Uh, Representative Ra I'm from South Georgia with a thick tongue. You just gonna have to bear with me. <laughs> so, uh, you, if you were in if you were in my district, you'd be the only one. Okay, it's about like Nimmer. It's about like Nimmer. <laughs> but uh, we uh, we took this measure up last week and and had quite a bit of conversation and questioning and and the representatives done a great job getting back and communicating with everyone via email on their on their questions and answers. And uh, this time, Representative, I want you to just kind of, uh, if you will, you don't have to walk through it line by line, but just touch on what were some of the uh, concerns, and, um, and let's hear from the committee. Okay. okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee, for allowing me to bring this bill uh, before you today. But HB 87 uh, LC 363107 should be in front of you. Uh, that will allow the Secretary of State uh, to allow for uh, – annual, biannual, or uh, up to a three-year renewal for your corporate uh, registrations. Right now it's an annual registration, so this would allow uh, the Secretary of State to do a three-year registration. And that came about from uh, business owners just saying, uh, and some people own entrepreneurs, there's a lot of serial entrepreneurs in Georgia, uh, which is a good thing, they like starting companies. And they said, if I could just do this every three years, it'd be a whole lot easier if I can do that with my website. So that's what the um, uh, genesis of the bill was, and that's what uh, uh, I brought forward you last week. 
So people asked some questions, and then I sent that to Chairman Nimmer and also to your legislative aide, uh, Mr. Doss, um, and I can go through some of the questions. Uh, Representative Kendrick uh, asked several questions, and uh, hopefully I've covered those to, <laughs> to, her, to her satisfaction. Uh, and uh, fortunately we have today, I believe, uh, the Secretary of State's office here to speak to the bill. And so uh, if there's any other questions that you want to ask him, you feel they weren't answered, maybe that would be the best person to answer. Um, and I think with that, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, I don't know if you want to ask some questions now. We'll open it up. That's, the floor. that's fine. Uh, I just want to give the committee a, an opportunity. We, we've all heard this bill. We heard the, uh, the, the conversation and questions last week. Uh, everyone should have been copied on an email. I'm thinking who had questions, seeing the replies. At this time, are there any questions from the committee? Uh, to him, to the author of the bill. Number 15. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's really just a follow-up to the answer that was given from the Office of the Secretary of State, and I do think that they could probably speak to this as well. But since it's your bill, um, I wanted to see if maybe you had any interest in amending it because it does, I mean, the Secretary of State does say the information could likely become stale and papers could be sent to the wrong address. Uh, well, that would be at the discretion of the committee. Uh, I guess the question about information being stale, with a one-year renewal, it could still become stale, which if someone goes out of business or if they move, uh, they're really supposed to uh, update their records, and whether it's one, two, or three, the onus is on, um, you know, the business owner for, you know, updating that information. Okay, thank you. Any other uh, comments or questions from the committee for the author of the bill? All right, this time, I, I want to ask uh, the director of NFIB, uh, Mr. Nathan Humphreys, to come up and uh, give comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'll, I'll be real brief, but I uh, just want to say I appreciate you bringing this bill. This is a good, good government bill. <clears throat> Simplifies things for small businesses. Um, I often get questions sometimes, what's the number one regulation or licensing thing you could fix for small business? And my answer is all of them <laughs> because it's kind of the, the death by a thousand paper cuts. It's not one big thing. It's just a ton of little things stacked up uh, in a pile that uh, is just – burdensome and hard for business members to keep keep track of and keep to this would just it's just a really small thing but it, again it would go a long way to help small businesses and I will say uh, Secretary of State in Georgia has been a good friend to small business he's an NFIB member and his office has always worked well with our members and um, I know they might have questions as far as implementation goes but uh, overall we really like this bill and appreciate your favorable consideration. Thank you, Mr. Humphrey. You do have a uh, question from yes, the sir. committee if you <coughs> will yield, sir. Number 13. Thank you. I'm over here. Oh, sorry. And I wasn't here last week, and I apologize, so I'm probably going to ask some questions that might have come up before. We're talking about business licenses. Correct. Throughout the state of Georgia, whether they pay them to a municipality or pay them to a county. No, no, we're, no, we're talking no. with the Secretary of State's office. Just the Secretary of State. This has nothing to do with. No, no, this, no. So this is just for renewal of a corporation Correct. and the, for the name renewal. So if Correct. you're not incorporated, this does not affect you. Say that one more time. If you are not incorporated. Correct. This Correct. does not affect you. It only, only if you're affects incorporated. incorporated folks. Okay. Um, I know you've mentioned somewhere here, and I don't quite understand all the numbers on how much um, it could save the businesses, which of course is great. Um, since we always look at the bottom line with the state of Georgia and revenues coming in, if everyone was to do it, how much money would it reduce from the budget of Georgia? Mr. Humphrey, if you don't mind, not to cut you off, but Representative Henson's question, I'd like to channel to the author of the bill. I think he's already pulled those numbers up and is prepared to give that sure. uh, answer. Good. Thank you. Drafted, we do not have in it a discount. So it's really you could just um, 
for like a, a for-profit corporation is fifty dollars a year. If they did a three-year, they would still pay a hundred. They would pay hundred and fifty dollars. They don't get a discount, so there should be really no reduction to state coffers, other than if everyone does three years, there'll be a big you know flush in there. But then the next year, the uh, but if you do balance it over the period of time, uh, that is something that uh, someone could do later on uh, down the road. But that was not the purpose of this bill. This was really uh, to lower. Uh, the, the filing that you would have to do instead of having to do it annually, you could do every two years or every three years. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you for that answer. All right, Mr. Humphrey, you may take a seat. No yeah. other questions. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, getting up speaking. Yeah. Um, we do have someone here, uh, Mr. Wilkerson from uh, uh, Secretary of State's office. If, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Mr. Stewart, but uh, if you don't mind coming up to the podium, I will put you on the spot. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, see, I know there was a couple of questions that wanted to be uh, uh, sent straight to you guys. So, uh, uh, Representative Kendrick. Um, so I asked this question several times, and it never quite got answered. Um, and I think he wasn't, the, the Secretary of State's office didn't quite understand what I was saying. So let me try to ask this question uh, differently. <coughs> So say a business uh, renews for three years, so they pay, um, what, what, that would be $150 for those three years. Normally, uh, for your annual registration, the Secretary of State will send you out a notice, usually via email, and say you need to update your information. And at that time, you can update your registration, your principal place of business, and all that good stuff, and you pay your, your renewal fee. Under this, Will businesses still get a notice so that they can update their information without being charged the $20 that you have to um, charge if you want, want to do an amended registration? Um, I believe so. So uh, I believe I, I have Cody Whitlock with me. So, Mr. Chairman, forgive me. This is my first full week with the Secretary's office. So I, I brought a little oh, bit of well, backup you get, Cody. All right, no, Cody, you're going to have to sit down. We want Stewart to answer every question. I brought a little bit of backup with you me. You know, Stewart, it's amazing. My board just lit up. <laughs> so I'll have Cody speak to it. So with the three-year, uh, I guess currently the annual registration period um, lasts from January through April. Um, Right around December-ish, we start to send out the reminders. That way we can kind of stagger the system and we're not all hit at once. Uh, if you do file it annually, that's when you have that time within that time period is to change your principal office address, uh, registered agent, officers if you have a corporation, et cetera. Say in, at this current time in July, after the annual registration period is done and you, your officers changed, you will still need to file that amendment, um, which would still cost you. So in terms of spreading it out over a three-year period, I do not believe that would change. You would just file for profit corporation $150, and if in that three-year three time frame, your officers change or something like that, then you would still have to pay again. Does that? Yeah, so essentially they would have to pay, if, if they did the annual registration and kept doing the annual registration, um, then they would not have to pay the twenty dollars. But you're saying if they pay, if they, in, if they pay, if they pay one hundred fifty dollars in advance, they're not going to get the benefit of the annual uh, renewal. So when you send it in December or whenever, when they can update that information, usually you can just pay your renewal fee. But since they've already paid in advance, you're saying they're going to have to pay an extra twenty dollars if they exercise this two or three year option. Correct. Okay, I just want everybody to know that. Thank you for that clarification. Yep. I think everybody's got it now. <laughs> Do we have any other questions for the Secretary of State's office before uh, Mr. Wilkinson sits down? All right. Thank you, Stuart, Thanks for being for here. Chairman. Thank you. All right, this time I want, well, number 14. That you. brought a question. Is there a way? Is your, is your question for uh, the Secretary of State's office or the yes. author of the bill? Yes, because I think what Representative Kinch okay. is what she asked, if the if the business owner takes advantage of the three years, um, then they're paying $150, but annually, if they needed to update their information, they'll have to pay $20. Yes, so. However, 
if they do not take advantage of, and this is what I need to make sure I heard correctly, if they do not take advantage of the multi-year and they just renew annually, mm -hmm. they can update their information without paying the extra $20. With, if they renew it within that annual registration yes. renewal period, correct? Yes. Yes. With that in mind, is there an opportunity to waive the twenty dollars fee to update their information if we're trying to encourage business owners to do the multi-year? Um, I'm not, you know, familiar no, with our, our our fee okay. schedule or anything like that. Um, I can tell you how much each thing is, but in terms of would we waive such a fee? I can't. I can't speak to that without, you know. Getting with the boss. So. Gentlemen, hold tight. Representative, have you had any conversation with the Secretary of State's office on how their database would work and the fee processing as far as giving that discount over for the multi year? Is, is that going to be possible in their system? Uh, uh, the fee discount? Yeah. It, uh, oh, for for that Representative fee. Kendrick's uh, talking about. The, the Secretary of State's office indicated that. Uh, that they they would they want people to be able to update so that uh, if they do change address or do change officers that they can do that. But we didn't actually specifically talk to the issue about what Rep Representative Kendrick did about the twenty dollars. Okay. So I don't know if that requires um, um, a change in this bill so that you specify that or we just let it go and and uh, you see. Tell you what, Representative, I, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to open the floor from the committee. I don't see any other questions from the committee. I know there's some confusion right here on whether or not you've got to put it in the language of the bill for the multi-year convenience and how the renewal process, the renewal fees will be, whether in full or at a, at a reduced rate. Right. Um, I'm going to open it up for the floor of the committee to make a recommendation on what they'd like to see done with this bill, HB 87. And we're going to uh, we're going to anticipate that you're going to get with the Secretary of State's office and Representative Kendrick and get a resolution on that before if this bill moves forward today before it moves beyond rules because this will need to be fixed. And if it does move out of here today and the language does need to be clarified in the legislation, we're going to ask for it to be sent from rules back to here. Grant. With the, with the understanding that yep. if it moves out today, okay? Yep. We've got uh, number 22. M Mr. Chairman, if, uh, if, if, if you would allow, I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to do pass and allow the, the author of the bills work real hard on this and, uh, and done a good job of answering questions. And like I said, this process is not over, but think time's, time's moving on. So yep. I would like to make a motion to do pass. All right, if you will just hold on, we got we got others that want to speak right now. So if you'll just hold on one second and hold that motion, Mr. Chairman, number thirteen. Thank you. I would like to see a correction made to this before it moves out of our committee. What I would really like to see the Secretary of State's office do is, if I pay. If I'm a corporation and I pay a multi-year, three-year multi-year fee up front, I would like the opportunity, if I need it, f during that renewal period of January to April, to be able to send something in changing my offices or my address at no fee whatsoever because I'm doing it within that period of time. That way you would get the three-year renewal, which we're trying to move to, the multi-year, but we're also not penalizing someone if they change their board of directors on an annual basis or anything. So I would like that either in legislation. I'd like to see that before we move it out, mainly because as a member of this committee, this is the only opportunity that I get to have any impact whatsoever in this bill. I'm not on rules. I can't impact it. We don't amend bills on the House floor. Rarely do we ever anymore, so I have no impact there. My option is that it comes out of the committee I serve on correct, or I have to vote against it on the House floor, which I prefer not to do. 
So I'd like to see it corrected. We could always have a special called meeting, couldn't we, just to move the bill on um, sooner if need be? We, we could do that, Representative. I, I'm going to ask uh, Stuart, if you will, and Cody maybe possibly come back on. Chair's got one question that may clear some of this up. Is it currently in law how that process goes when you're renewing the, the uh, uh, renewal fees? I believe so, and I can I can double check, and I can get you that code section if you'd like. It's specific where where that is. Okay, thank you. Number twelve. Is that you? Oh, sorry. it was for another issue. Say again. It was for another issue. Got gotcha. you. All right, we've got a motion on the floor. Uh, one second, wait. Number twenty-three. Well, I just wanted to say I, I really appreciate the convenience component of this, and that to me is what it's all about. Um, and, and I'm just concerned about tying the hands of the Secretary of State's office and defining for them what that should be. I think um, that they're highly capable to figure that out. That's really my concern. I just really like the convenience. I'm. It's addressed with me every year from constituents about having to renew every year. For, for one reason or another, they're, they're dissatisfied with having to, and so I'm just, I'm real excited about the opportunity here. That, that's just where I stand personally, um, and, and I appreciate your bill very much. Number 16. Hey, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, it, there's nothing in this that would require anyone who regularly changed their board or their agents of record. They could still go to annual and get the, f whatever you want to call it, they could update their, um, nobody's required to go with the three year, right? Right, correct. It's a business, every business decision makes a free will choice whether so, it wants to do one year, two year, or three year. So if it's one that doesn't change it every three years or every year or anything, then, then the convenience, it would just save the paperwork of, uh, filing annually and it would right. have no fiscal impact but if we started talking about waiving a twenty dollar change fee like i think it was mentioned that if i can make go on sure it was mentioned that if there's a change in july after you've had your december through april you've got to pay the twenty dollars even though you just paid fifty that same that same thing wouldn't change whether you changed it two months later or two years later you'd have to pay the change fee and there's no fiscal impact to the department is that uh, I'm, I will. Is that? Yeah. Cody, you may. So, essentially, yeah. So the the annual registration period is January one through April first. Within that time frame, you have to pay the annual registration, whether or not you update your information or not. Right. Um, some entities, you know, never change, and we have this feature now with uh, the new eCorp system. It's just a one-click express annual registration. You just click it, put in your credit card information, you're done. Um, to your point, if the entity is not going to change within that three-year period, you can just do potentially if the if the bill passes, you would just $150, click credit card information, you're done. Um, but yeah, if even if you the current annual registration period, if it, if if something changed after the annual registration deadline, if it changed three times, you would file three separate times. Your you know officers principal office uh, address changed and your officers changed again. You'd still have to pay that 20 20 20, and then come January again next year, you would have that fifty dollar period to potentially change the officers again. Does that answer? It, it does. Just may I ask one more question. Yes, Just you may. You, if you can help me out, um, what's the requirement for a fiscal note if we were to waive a fee or to ask a fee to be waived? Would it require it to go back through an extended process if we're going to have a three year and we either lowered the fee or if we waived the $20 renewal, does that require a, a fiscal note? Mm -hmm. You that know, point? that's a great, I, I'll be honest with you, Chair, I don't know the answer to that one. I know we have, we have pulled what it would cost. Um, on the, uh, the yeah. author of the bill has it uh, because it's posted on Secretary of State's website what their fee calculators are and, and everything, right. so it's in there. Uh, and I, Representative, I did ask it's the Secretary there. of State if <clears throat> I started out with some discounts and then I started, uh, they gave back information and it'd be a, a cost of two million dollars if it if it was this percentage discount or you know ten million dollars and for the sake of of simplicity for this bill uh, i figured let's just bite off this little portion right here let's get uh if this goes forward let them get their computer system 
uh, able to handle the three year, and then we could look at a discount on renewals down the road. But it would require a fiscal note because it would affect the budget right. if you give a discount. Thank you. Yeah, and just, just for clarity off of Representative Newton right there, I think uh, one of the things we don't want to lose focus of, the author of the bill's intent of this legislation is not to mandate that small businesses or any businesses go to a three-year, multi-year uh, licensing process, but it is an option if you want to take it. So uh, to Re Chair Chairwoman Carter mentioned the convenience. Uh, this is just an option out there if you want the convenience of going to a multi-year registration. Uh, number 13. I just need a clarification. If I do a one-year renewal every year, mm -hmm. I change my board of directors on a yearly basis. I put that information in during that January to April. Mm -hmm. I'm only paying $50. I do not pay $20 additional for that. Correct. If I pay for three years, and when that January to February rolls around, if I make a change, then I am paying $20. Yes. Even though it's within that January to February, if I am not renewing on a yearly basis. So if you paid the $150 for the three years, yes. you would still pay that $20 change because we, you've paid for that entire time frame. Even if I pay for it in the January to April Correct. time frame, I'm still paying for that $20. Correct. Yes. Correct. Thank you. And, and again, I think it goes with the clarity right here, not to get bogged down in the weeds of it. This is, this is an option if you know that you're going to stay status quo with the way your business structure is. You can take advantage of the multi-year and reduce some, just some regulatory red tape on small businesses. That's, if you think you may go through some changes, uh, then you may want to stay in the one-year renewal process. So let, let's, let's try to stay focused on that. Number 14. I wave because we're in the weeds. <laughs> well let's let's thank you all right all right i want to make sure because i think we're fixing to move on to another question uh, about the same piece of legislation but a different topic in that legislation um and we still have a motion from chairman shaw here that we've got to move on in a moment and we're running short of time uh, but again, this is not a mandate. This is an option for your businesses and your districts to take advantage of if they so choose. And like anything, we pay for convenience. Uh, this happens to be one that if you change, it could cost you some more, but that's, that's up to the individual. We're just giving them something to choose from. Number 12. Oh, on a different issue? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> So um, on the last page of the questions, one of the questions that, that I asked was uh, about changing may to shall and then extending the time period if it's legal um, for which the Secretary of State had to implement it just because may obviously is permissive. Um, and I, I've talked with the, uh, the author about this and um, so I'm just going to throw it out there that I would prefer if it said shelf to the Secretary of State and then delayed it one year if that is something that's legal to do. Because I think the concerns were that the Secretary of State's office, it would be too much of a time crunch. And so that's why they wanted May. But on the flip side, if you put May in there, then they don't have an obligation to implement this at all in all our discussions. Just or we're just discussing because there's no shell in there. Representative Kendrick, you're represent, uh, referencing line 53, notwithstanding any other law to the contrary, the Secretary of State may, and you want to change that to shall? Hold on. And you said you have spoken with the author of this about this change? Yeah. Well, it's in, I asked them in, the, in the, yeah. the email questions on the last page. No. Right. I think you would have to, if. There are several places. There, there are many places it would have to be changed in there. Let me, uh, yeah. let me ask the author a question here. If, if it was m my understanding, you and I talked about the may and the shall earlier, and this, uh, this got it in a position where the Secretary of State's office was comfortable. Exactly. Uh, while I understand your question, Representative Kendrick, I wanna, I wanna go back to the original conversation about this and, and help me understand. Uh, the Secretary of State was concerned that if we put in shall, 
it's not that he again, he's against the bill, but what he's concerned about is if the governor signed this bill, it went forward, and he signs it on June 30th. Yeah. But then come January, he's only, so the Secretary of State, once he knows it's an official, uh, it's law, he doesn't have enough, perhaps doesn't have enough time to change his software system. But on, meanwhile, he's held with this shall, has to do it by uh, the next year, but he doesn't really have enough time. So it's really more of a timing issue. So what I said to Representative Kendrick, I wasn't against the idea of May to Shell, but it would probably then we'd want to say, but shall not be, but shall be implemented no later than, and give the Secretary of State's office like 18 months, uh, or no later than. So if he could get it done sooner, he would certainly try to, but uh, it, we just didn't want to put him in an issue, uh, in a situation, first of all, that he would then oppose the bill, but also uh, put him in a situation where he couldn't do uh, fulfill the wishes of the legislature just because of the, how long it takes to do software changes. So I thought, um, I thought if we left it as may, he, uh, I, I understand that uh, he supports the bill other than that, and he uh, probably appreciates, and I don't put words in his mouth, but I think he probably appreciates that we're the best state uh, due to business in uh, for four years running. So I'm sure uh, we all like to do whatever we can to help businesses, and that's the purpose of this bill. All right, thank you, Representative. I, I thought you and I had had a conversation about the May and the Shall, and, and that's why yeah. we had changed it, or you had changed yes. it to May. Yes, and it was really the Secretary of State referred okay. to, me, to me May for right now. All right. That would be. All right, committee. We uh, go back to uh, Chairman Shaw. We have a motion uh, due pass, and I believe we had a second from Representative Carter. Chair, excuse me, Chairwoman Carter. Um, we'll say Chairman Shaw. Um, I'm going to just withdraw my motion and give y'all more time to work on this um, and get with the Secretary of State's office and just make sure that um, these questions about the, the $20 and everything is, is, is answered. So I'm going to withdraw that motion. All right. Withdraw the motion is noted. And uh, at this point, do we have any other further any further business of the committee to take up today? Is it, is it the understanding of everybody, uh, Chairman Shaw's withdrawal of his motion do pass? He withdrew his motion to give the author of the bill time to address the $20 question. And I would urge the author at that point maybe to get with Representative Kendrick and you and uh, Representative Kendrick and Secretary of State's office work on the language uh, that she's inquisitive about uh, on the may and the shall and the date. That sound good? All right, if there's no further business, uh, we stand adjourned. Thank you.